What's happening, everyone? How are you guys doing today? Hope you're having a beautiful morning, early afternoon, late afternoon, evening, whatever it may be. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we are going to go ahead and begin and complete our full album listen, King Crimson, their fifth studio album, 1973. That will be the very, very oft requested, very popular Lark's Tongues in Aspic. Uh, I have heard about this album for the longest time, actually based on the title and the album artwork. This is probably the album I've been most wanting to listen to for quite a while. And I figured, you know, what better time than Long Song Saturday. As it happens, there's a track on here called Book of Saturday, so <laughs> it actually just works out. This is one of those albums that I tried to look up everyone that recommended this particular album to me, but it's... There's so many mentions of the album, I can't quite differentiate from like who's recommended it and who's just named it and just put it in the comments. I mean, but there's there's a lot. I can I can definitely tell you that. Like if I spend a moment and look, uh, I see Frugal Severin. You recommended this one, Robert Jewell, uh, Mr. Wonders. Did you recommend this album as well? The Reaper Man. There's a lot. It just goes on and on and on. So uh, I'm very excited to go ahead and listen to this. I don't know what to expect from this particular era or iteration of King Crimson as they've gone through many, many. So I don't know quite what their sound is going to be on this album, but I'm excited to find out. Like I said, I've heard a lot about this one. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. I have brewed, brewed, <laughs> brewed the biggest cup of matcha that, that I could have for this. I, I, I hand made it, ground it, not made it, but I ground it, did the proper process, even even frothed it. And I don't usually froth my drinks, but I did today. So let's go ahead and begin with part one, Lark's Tongues in Aspic, uh, which is apparently an instrumental as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. We'll talk about each track. Obviously, these will be edited on YouTube. Click the Patreon link to watch it for free. You don't have to sign up. You can just click it. And uh, let's go ahead. Let's start with... Lark's Tongues and Aspic, part one. I might have to turn the fan on. It's gonna get hot. Does it begin with, with silence? Because I, I press play. I have a feeling my my Spotify is doing that thing. Hold on. Let me let me hold on. Let me let me just test it. Try try it again. It can't begin with just silence. Let me try another track. Oh, cause my vol... Guys, I didn't put my volume up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Jeez. That is hot. Okay, as the first track on the album, <laughs> this is near indescribable. No one prepared me for this. <laughs> no one prepared me to listen to this. This is, at least it sounds like to me, it's very freeform, incredibly abstract, a huge diversity of sound just alone in here. Seemingly classically inspired, love, love the violin, David Cross. Absolutely fantastic. Probably my favorite element in the music itself. Let me turn my, my volume up, you guys can't even hear me. Definitely my favorite element in the music here. As soon as it's introduced, it adds a new edge, a new flavor into the bowl. You open up with what I think is like kalimba, like playing playing on Columbia or, or something like that some sort of metal bar based instrument perhaps I don't know it's a very interesting opening I'm like okay settling in for the scene that's about to take place and then they get into just an incredibly heavy heavy moment introduced of course like I said by a cross on the violin but then they all get into it and I mean it's it, it has that crimson industrial kind of sound 
even later on, Bruford brings in the trash symbol, as I call it, that like that sound, it's so trashy, <laughs> in a good way. It's a dirty symbol. I like that. It sounds warped and broken. Um, you're just adding into that, that metal atmosphere, not genre-wise, but tone-wise. I just think that's so cool. But then, you know, amongst all that heaviness that comes in, which is so, so overpowering, so awesome, so brilliant, it then quiets right back down and allows Cross to, to kind of take us into this completely different era. He transforms the direction of the music. So we're definitely getting something very interesting here with King Crimson. Looking at some of the history on this album and the band at this particular moment, it says that this is King's, King's Crimson. This is King Crimson's third incarnation. So this is their third setup. What was their second? Obviously I know their first, but what was their second in, incarnation? Let me, let me see if I can figure that out real quick. I guess that would be, I'm, I'm assuming that's in the wake of Poseidon and Lizard, perhaps, or Islands. I don't know. One of those, one of those, I guess, will be considered the, the second incarnation. Looking at it, either way, this definitely sounds different <laughs> than their beginnings, and definitely different than where they would go. Of course, Red and Discipline we have listened to, Thrak we've listened to, because this does have that that industri semi-industrial sound to it, but it has a new kind of freeform sound as well that is very interesting. I don't, I don't think I've heard the band perform in that particular way before, but they pull it off extremely excellently. And I would imagine that this is probably all improvised, how they came up with this, just because I know that sometimes the band is, you know, keen to doing that. I can't quite say, I, I can look it up real quick, see if I can find anything, but I would venture to guess that this would be improvised the way that they came up with all this. But how incredible. I mean, let me see if I can go back to the heavy moment in here. Did you hear Bruford rip it? <laughs> I mentioned it during when that happened, but that ooh, 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 that that's some that's not something to play with. But hear how intense Cross's violin work is. Uh, and then you have that that deepness that comes from underneath behind that. But Contrast the intensity of these moments with this. This reminds me of some of the classical performances we've been watching live on the channel. Like, that's where that takes me. This takes me into a concert hall watching an orchestra perform. In this case, watching the band perform. I, I think that that's just a cool twist in the formula. And if anything, if anything you can say about King Crimson, they're always going to throw in a really interesting twist into the music. So, looking at this particular track, and I guess the suite as a whole about Lark's Tongues, it says that, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Part one is the longest en entry in the pental pent pentalogy, pentalogy. I don't know if I've ever seen used that word before. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. I guess you also have the percussion of Jamie Muir. Uh, that is, that is binding this part you could say amongst Bruford's drumming here as well uh bird calls metallic clangs horns breaking crockery and tin ripping are all featured in Muir's repertoire and I did mention during the track there's there's a few moments where it sounds like he's just going through the kitchen and pulling out things and throwing them against the wall and recording it so that also kind of lends itself to that metallic industrial sound as well uh which I think is just really cool which I actually see here uh, the song has been described as having a kitchen sink sensibility. And I could I could definitely agree with that. <laughs> it says that according to Fripp, part one was conceived as the beginning of a King Crimson performance. And part two as the end. Which obviously we haven't heard as of yet. But that was absolutely incredible. Uh, no lyrics to go over in this particular track. So with that... Uh, let us move on into the next track here in the album, which is going to be Book of Saturday, which, like I said, it is Saturday at this moment, exactly 7.37 p.m. To be exact, the wife is out having a wine and paints with her with her cousin and, and like, well, actually, it's all our cousins <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, so I am here being loud, drinking my, my matcha, which I haven't, I need to sip on a little bit more. Anyways. Let's go ahead and get into the next track, Book of Saturday, 
Hope you guys are here for it. Hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're having a good time. If you're having a good time already, why not just press the like button real quick? Like, you're already here. Just, just click it. Anyways, let's get into the next track. Beautiful. Okay. I would love to talk about Book of Saturday. I would love to talk about this track. Think about the the improvisation, the harsh sounds, the beauty of the first track, an introduction. This settles you down. You're getting already two different, com completely different faces of the band. You get, I guess you get the beast and the beauty in a different sense. And looking at the track listing for this album, this is the, the shortest track because the rest of the tracks are pretty much right around seven to eight minutes. So this is just a little bit of a break, a little bit of a rest in the music. I'm sure that the rest of it will be intense in some capacity, but this is like a, a little walk on the beach before you get into the water and get hit by the waves. <laughs> this is the romanticism before the reality. And how, how great does wet and sound absolutely amazing did i say amazing i didn't mean to say that he sounds amazing his bass playing alongside of it is just gorgeous taking the place of greg lake another vocalist bassist and they have two different styles but how good does he sound has that hopeful slightly romantic wide-eyed kind of feel Love his voice. Love his playing alongside of his voice. Wonderful job. Um, of course, the melody throughout the song is, is beautiful as well. But then that backwards guitar comes in. And I, I love that sound. I love the way that Frick does that. It's one of those sounds that just immediately I like. So when I hear that, I'm in for the ride. And it just creates this very otherworldly beauty as that incorporates it into the music. I think that that was absolutely wonderful. This is a good track. Now I'm curious, is this track a popular one amongst King Crimson fans? Or is this one kind of left out in the cold? Because I know it's short, it may not have like a huge lasting impact. As we move further into the album, I'm imagining that this is a great piece on the album. I don't know how popular it is on its own, but so far, I think it's fantastic. Uh, let's get into these lyrics. If I could only, dis I'm sorry, if I only could deceive you, forgetting the game, every time I try to leave you, you laugh just the same. Cause my wheels never touch the road and the jumble of lies we told just returns to my back to weigh me down. So maybe he's trying to get out of the relationship but just can't get out. We lay cards upon the table, the backs of our hands, and I swear I like your people, the boys in the band. Reminisce, reminisces, gone astray, coming back to enjoy the fray in a tangle of night and daylight sounds. When I see the, the line, we lay cards upon the table, it's like we're putting all our, we're putting our honest opinions on the table and to bear, to share with each other. All completeness in the morning, asleep on your side, I'll be waking up the crewmen, banana boat ride. She responds like a limousine brought alive on the silent screen to the shuddering breath of yesterday. It's the sucker of the needy, incredible scenes. I'll believe you in the future, your life and death dreams. I don't know what this song's about. <laughs> As the cavalry of despair takes a stand in the lady's hair for the favor of making Sweet Sixteen, you make my life and times a book of bluesy Saturdays, and I have to choose. So is this, uh, 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 let's just say, for example, someone leaving their partner to tour with the band? You make my life and times a book of bluesy Saturdays, and I have to choose. What is the choice? To leave this person and to pursue a career musically, perhaps, or, or something like that? I do like the line, you make my life and times a book of bluesy Saturdays. So Saturdays are typically looked at in a positive light, a break from work, a weekend. You can relax, spend time with your family, your friends, do your thing. But bluesy Saturdays, there's, maybe there's a little bit of a sadness to it. Maybe someone not that you don't that you're not able to spend time with when you want to, so you still have the Saturday, but it's a little bit sad. That's at least 
what I'm kind of feeling from this track. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. Uh, but anyways, nice little track. And I guess actually breaking the fourth wall. Saturday is a rest day. Like you know, you you Saturday you're usually off of work. You're relaxing. It's a weekend. You're chilling. And this song, Book of Saturday, is relaxing, chill. Mm, feels like a break. Anyways, let's move on to the next track, which which is going to be Exiles. Let's go. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say it. Perfect song. Perfect song. That has everything that I would want from, from King Crimson in this particular stage. This hits. I like the last two tracks, but this one hits in a different spot, in that sweet spot when it comes to King Crimson. Oh man, where, where do I even begin with this one? Everyone's hitting it right here. Wetton, once again, love his singing here. He's used the perfect amount. His singing isn't used like some spice that is, is imported from some country and you're like, ooh, this is really fancy. It cost me a lot of money. Let's put it all in the food. No, you put a little bit in the food to make the flavor kick up. And I think that Wetton's voice and his bass playing is that perfect amount of flavor because he does have a good amount of, of, of singing in the music, but it's not like constantly, you know? Not that that would be a bad thing, but I just like the way that that's used here. Going back to Bruford's drumming. I really like his style in this track in particular. You have a lot of flams, a lot of tight snare rolls, and he uses the cymbals, I guess, <laughs> using the same word again, sparingly. I was listening to his drumming throughout here, and he's playing a lot without the actual use of cymbals here, which I just thought was a really nice effect. He's actually playing a lot on the snare and, and toms, really, but... It just adds this kind of bare effect to the music, especially with Fripp's playing acoustic. Sounds absolutely beautiful the way that he's playing here. Um, the violin, once again, with Cross. Uh, Mellotron, I think you got a little bit of that in here, too. It, it, just, it just all comes together in this perfect little stew. I want to say in... Sometimes listening to a song for the first time and talking about it is hard because <laughs> I don't have the best memory, but... There's a, music, there's a point when the music all kind of builds up layer upon layer, and then the atmosphere drops out, and you're just kind of left with the bass playing and the, the drums from Bruford, which I think is a really nice effect. That's when it really gets back down to that kind of very sensual kind of feeling here. Uh, but like I said, crosses once again with that, that violin just sweeping us away, sweeping me away. I should be speaking for myself more than anything. I think that this is a perfect song from King Crimson. I'm, I'm kind of curious, once again, is this one that, you know, a lot of King Crimson fans like, or is this one also kind of left out in the cold? I don't know, but it's absolutely wonderful. Listen to that explosion. When you hear that explosion of melody, the soft riffs of the guitar, cross, uh, just singing, uh, wetting on the bass, that's one of those moments where all the instruments come together in... In, in all honesty, the only word I can, th I can think of, they come together in this beautiful orgasm of energy because it all is just, just arriving at the same moment and, and performing in this beautiful, exhilarating like, like moment in the music, you know? Like a climax in music can go on for a long time, but it's that initial hit that, that like sets you on fire, you know? And you can find, I'm sure, thousands of examples in whatever songs do that to you but there's always that moment when the music goes over the edge think of awaken from yes the moment when the organ comes in at the very end you get that climax it's like that that one moment that just takes you over the edge that little moment is is one of those moments in exiles that personally takes me over the edge and i just really really enjoy let's get into these lyrics now in this faraway land strange that the palms of my hands should be damp with expectancy Spring, the air is turning mild. City lights and the glimpse of a child. Hey, we saw city lights over on my other channel. Of the alleyway infantry. Friends, do you know what I mean? Rain and the gathering green. 
of an afternoon out of town. I don't know what he means. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know what he's talking about. Maybe we'll find out later. But Lord, I had to go. The trail was laid too slow behind me to face the call of fame or make a drunkard's name for me. Though now this better life has brought a different understanding, and through these endless days shall come a broader sympathy. And though I count the hours to be alone, no injury. So the song is called Exiles, and he does describe leaving town, a journey of some sort. Uh, so he, I'm assuming he's left, perhaps a responsibility. Perhaps he has been exiled. He has been kicked out for whatever reason. And he's trying to find his way. Because he says, though now this better life has brought a different understanding. So he has gained knowledge through this trial. But... He does wish he wasn't alone. <laughs> My home was a place by the sand, cliffs and a military band, blue and air of normality. But obviously he's no longer there, hence the title of the track. Anyways, uh, looking here, it says, the track highlights the lyrical abilities of Richard Palmer James, formerly of Supertramp, who was hired by the band to write lyrics for the songs Book of Saturday and Easy Money on the same album. The lyrics depict an individual struggling with life in a foreign land and reflecting upon the life they left behind. There you go. That is the exile. Let's turn over the album, metaphorically, and get into the first track on the second side of the album. That is going to be Easy Money. Don't you just wish that money just sometimes came easy to you? <laughs> Let's go ahead and get into it. Easy Money. get the joke okay easy money oh to me this is a showcase for Bruford and uh, and Jamie this is a, a drummer percussion percussion showcase Bruford okay I don't mean I don't sometimes I don't know where to start Let, let's start here this song is a straight hard drop of a groove on a shoestring budget with all these this is the kitchen sink of percussion and sound effects and different things going on that are just thrown into this track in the most like not random but just <laughs> seemingly random moments um you really get every single sound here i like how a lot of the lyrics are accented by these sound effects but they just get in there one way or another no matter what it's like they said <laughs> listen we found this in the kitchen use it but, but it doesn't make sense in the album. Use it. <laughs> I found this broken spatula. Bring it in. I found a spork. Toss it in there. Whatever it is, they're just tossing everything. Um, I wonder if during the, in the singing from Wetton, in the do-do-do, like in the beginning and the ending, I wonder if Bruford was getting nostalgia <laughs> for John Anderson. Anyways, that was just a thought I, I had. I really like the instrumental break in the middle. I wasn't a huge fan of the easy money. It, it was, I guess, a chorus, but I don't know. I didn't really like the way that it sounded. Uh, the rest of the singing was fine. I just didn't like the actual, I guess, chorus there. Um, but I really liked that instrumental part where, like I said, you're really allowing Bill and Jamie to kind of have at it within that groove. Of course, you know, Fripp gets in with the solo, crosses in there doing violin stuff, but it, it was just really interesting to hear Jamie and Bill kind of work off of each other. And I would imagine in a live performance of this particular track, that would be like the, the moment that their kind of, their creative forces are combining and you're watching the percussion over here, you're watching Bill over here, and they're just kind of making a racket. But a pleasant one, but you know what I mean? Like they're just making a racket, they're doing their thing, they're having a blast up there. That's what I imagine when I'm listening to the middle section all in here. And like I said, you have everyone else in there doing the same thing. That's why I said you have Wet and dropping a hard line groove. It's a simple, stated, but powerful groove. The stomping, the heavy walk from Bruford, like it's a great groove. Bum, bum, ba da da da. 
bum. It's like a quiet funk. It's a sidewalk funk. And you can kind of play off of that, which is what I'm saying, you know, primarily I feel Bruford and Jamie are doing. But like I said, Fripp and everyone else are in there as well. But that's my favorite part of the song uh, is that instrumental part. Singing, fine. Didn't love it. Singing is fine. I didn't like the easy money. I didn't like that part. But everything else sounded really, really nice in here as well. Uh, let's get into... <laughs> Let's get into the lyrics here. Because someone's strutting their stuff. Your admirers in the street gotta hoot and stamp their feet in the heat of your physique as you twinkle by in moccasin sneakers. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I was gonna try and, I was gonna make a joke and sing a song, but I, now I can't remember the chorus of the song. I was gonna sing Girl from Impanema, but I can't remember the chorus because the walking by. But I'm having a little bit of a stage fright moment or a camera fright, mo fright moment, and I can't remember it, and I'm, I'm freezing in front of you guys. I'm sorry. Anyways, you know the joke that I was going to make. And I thought my heart would break when you doubled up the stake. With your fingers all a shake, you never could tell a winner from a snake. Easy money. With your figure in your face strutting out at every race, throw a glass around the place. Show the color of your crimson suspenders. He said, he said show me, show me that lace. <laughs> We could take the money home, sit around the family throne. My old dog could chew his bone. For two weeks, we could appease the Almighty. That is the the, the, the most euphemism I've ever read. <laughs> oh, man. Your admirers in the street got to stamp your, your feet. Got, got no truck with the la-di-da. Keep my bread in an old fruit jar. Drive you out in my motor car, getting fat on your lucky star. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, let's let's go on to the next track. Uh, let's move on to the next track, which is going to be the Talking Drum. Isn't Talking Drum an album by Stevie Stevie Wonder? I think. Isn't uh? Let me, I'm looking it up real quick. Talking Drum. Isn't it an album from Stevie Wonder? Am I wrong? Talking Book, was it, maybe? Is it Talking Book from Stevie Wonder? There's there's something talking. There's an out Talking Book. Yeah, there it is. I see it now. Okay, anyways, let's move on into the next track here. The Talking Drum. Ba boom Well, that's slightly frightening. <laughs> I really like how Talking Drum grew from a whisper into a scream by the end. This track actually spoke. Jamie, on the percussion, I love how he starts off. You're, you're put into the desert, and then in the distance you hear... And it just walks up slowly, slowly up to you before you're face to face with this uh, th this drum. And he's playing on it, he's rolling, he's, he's throwing, he's getting down. And then ever so slowly, ever so slowly, one by one by one, everyone else comes alongside with it. Cross on the violin, frip on beautiful, beautiful, fiery, flamey, igniting guitar. Um, uh, Bruford on the drums, coming in very hard. And this is a track that just continually elevates and grows and climaxes. I said it during the track, but for some reason it reminded me of being like in an opium den. Not that I've ever been in one. It just gave me the sound. <laughs> gave me the feeling of being in one. Like, you know, like, I don't know, a character in a show or a movie, like they, they go in an opium den, den and the person like, try this. And they take their first puff or whatever it may be. And then like, they act normal. But then slowly it starts to turn and change and slowly they're hallucinating and stuff. And that's what it kind of felt like here. The intensity was just building up, building up. And even in the last few seconds, right before that, that musical scream, even before that, it's getting really intense. I would say especially because of Bruford, you hear him changing symbol, hitting the crash, bah, 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 bah. 
and then even kicks. He's adding a lot more at the very end, like at the very tail end. So even before that little abrupt ending, they're still adding it in. They're still going. And I can't say for sure. But that sounds like that sounds like something that was done production wise and from a production production point of view like they said just keep on ramping it up ramping it ramping it up ramping it up and then at some point like they recorded it obviously and then they they went back to the production side cut it at a certain point and added in that last kind of scream and then it goes from there because it felt so abrupt but like in a in a cool way it was abrupt not in like a a bad way but i just really like the way that this track evolved let me come back to it real quick and right in here, like, this is also the track that I would say most feels like the album cover. Because looking at the album cover, like I said, it does have an Eastern kind of kind of style to it. Something very mystical. And, I, and the music definitely has an Eastern style to it here as well. And it, it really feels like some sort of, besides an opium den, <laughs> I was thinking of. It definitely has some sort of journey to it as well there's there's a certain kind of adventure going on and i mean in these particular moments here it's moving it simmers but it's still played very coolly but like i said you know three minutes later you can feel everything just being pulled apart everything is just being torn asunder if you will and i just like the way that that's done uh, this obviously is an instrumental track, so there's nothing necessarily to, to look into here. I was going to see if there was anything in here uh, information-wise about this particular track. I don't see anything specifically about Talking Drum. Not that I see. So uh, with that, we'll move into the last track of the album. Lark's Tongues and Aspic Part 2. How will it carry on from Part 1? We'll find out shortly. Let's get into it. I like how that abruptly comes from that screen for I'm assuming it's just going to be space, but you never know, and I want to make sure. I want to make sure there's no hidden bonus track that I'm supposed to supposed to listen to, but there's 15 seconds of silence, so just making sure. Could I do one more immediately? Oh. <laughs> Was he asking for another take? See, I knew there might be something. I think, <laughs> I think he was asking for another take at the end. <laughs> he said, can I do one more? <laughs> I, I have a feeling. Okay. Uh, Lark's Tongues in Aspic Part 2. Um, <laughs> first of all, this is a track that melted my brain. This is definitely a track that I could not keep up with. The time signatures in that main part. Ba -da 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 -ba -da -da. I don't even know what it was. I can't even sing it. Uh, it was much easier when it got into the softer parts because I think it was 5-8. I could be wrong, but it was definitely easier to follow. Both those those loud riff led parts, I, I could not keep up with it. This definitely sounded like like the band were running out of tape and they said, okay, we got seven minutes to record our last ditch effort. Let's put all of our, our efforts, our last hurrah into this one because everyone really stole a spotlight and they all put 110% of, of energy into this track because it, it has a moment for everybody. It comes in hard, it hits heavy and it leaves you satisfied. That's what I feel from this track. That, that initial riff right there is incredibly like a little scratchy. It just makes you feel something, right? And like they're putting it in i like that swing in the groove like that seems like a very king crimson kind of swing right that it reminds me of something that would be in red as well but like not that but where am i getting to this see those little moments when they soften things up i really enjoy king crimson's take on atmosphere when they go that direction and most of their music has that as well but you know, they always have this nice contrast between the heavy and the light, and I just always, I'm always interested to see what they do in those light moments. This track, I will admit, I will admit off of first listen, it's my least favorite track on the album. I, I don't really, there's something slightly, what's the word? <laughs> I can think of a word, but I want to think of a, a cleaner word. 
that for for what I what I I feel from this. This feels a bit. I need to I need to find a synonym because, like I said, I can think of a word. <laughs> it's just not the word I would like to use. Um, uh, hold, give me a second. Um, I want a synonym for this word. Synonym. Uh, help me out. Um, this okay. Yes, these are these are much better words I can use than what I was thinking of. Uh, this feels a little bit self-indulgent. That that's I think the idea I, I'm kind of feeling. This feels a bit like self-indulgent. Like this might be cool to see and listen to live, but this kind of track honestly just leaves me a little bit cold. I don't feel like I've like I've gained anything after listening to it. Like you may not always realize it, but when you listen to music you generally gain something afterwards. You just may not immediately recognize that you did, whether that is enjoyment, a feeling of some sort. Even if you don't love a song, you've gained a, a sort of cursory knowledge of that song and the music, you know? You've gained something. This, I don't really feel like I've gained anything. It just feels cold to me. For as cool as it is to hear the musicians playing in here, it doesn't, it doesn't hit me personally like on a, on a feeling level you know and with all music no matter what the feeling may be you do want it to hit a specific feeling so uh, I will admit that this has this is my least favorite track on the album uh, even though it's well played and, and such anyways no lyrics to go over on this one as well I will tell you immediately my favorite track on the album if you couldn't guess is Exiles I think that is the perfect track for for this album and then I also really like Book of Saturday as well. That was that was really nice. So uh, this is the only one that I, I didn't like, really. But I will say that Exiles is <laughs> really good. Really, really good. So anyways, uh, I was just looking to see if there were any last, last minute facts about the album or anything. I do see here that the album spawned the concert staple Exiles, whose Mellotron introduction had been, had been adapted from an instrumental piece called Mantra which the band's original lineup had performed throughout 1969. So that's cool. So I, I guess it is a, a popular song then. So of course I'm going to like it. <laughs> Anyways, everyone, if you are at this point in the video, if you have gotten to this, this moment, the ending of the video, please, 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 please press the like button. Press the share button. Share this video. On your social media share it on I almost said YouTube but don't do that <laughs> share it on Facebook on Twitter on Instagram TikTok, Bumble Tinder I don't care wherever you're wherever you post 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 the video subscribe if you haven't already please let me know what you thought of the album is exiles your favorite track on the album is ask is Lark's Tongues in Aspic Part 2 your least favorite track on the album? I had, to, I, I had all the words mixed up. I was about to say Aspic and Lark's Tongue, but I was like, no, I don't think that's right. Was that your least favorite? Do you have opposite feelings of me? The same feelings. I want to know your feelings in the comments. Of course, if you enjoy what I do and you want to support me, you can do that on Patreon uh, for as little as $2 a month. Help me do what I do here on the channel. And um, that's, that's kind of it, guys. I hope that you enjoyed listening to the music alongside of me. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your night. I did finish my giant cup of matcha. Now, matcha is a slow-release caffeine. So right now, it's 8.37 at night. And I'm not, I'm not feeling it just yet. But that caffeine is going to kick me. So anyway, <laughs> have a wonderful rest of your night, guys. Thank you for being up with me. And I will talk to you all later. Bye.